Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, the second book in the New Testament. Thank you, worship team, for inviting us into God's presence so skillfully. And as we open the scriptures this morning, worship doesn't stop. The preaching of a sermon and the listening to a message, listening to God's word is also an act of worship. And so my prayer is that your heart won't stop worshiping because the music stopped, but that it will just continue on and actually climax as we see and hear of the glories of the one we're worshiping from his own words. Lord, do that for us this morning. You know, this week, seems now, some classes we took on the subject of philosophy. Those philosophy classes, when you first have to sign up for them, you're a little bit intimidated by them, and you think, oh my goodness, this is going to be difficult and boring. But we both talked about how we found those classes to be far more interesting than we had expected them to be. And, you know, in philosophy classes, one of the central topics that gets discussed in intro to philosophy and even many of the deeper classes is this debate about whether God exists or not. Philosophers and philosophy students have been been arguing about that. Have believed in the existence of God or gods. Most people. And so the conclusion that that there is a God doesn't exactly qualify as news to most people. But in fact, mankind is probably given more concentrated, more combined aggregate attention and been more concerned about knowing something about the divine and the supernatural than we've probably given to all other subjects in life, all of the concerns in life put together. But the news that God is here, God is here right now in our midst and that he's on our side, actively working to help us in the way that we most badly need help, now that qualifies as news. Because as common as belief in God is, there's an enormous amount of unfamiliarity with God and an enormous amount of guesswork about what goes on when it comes to God. And it leads people into all kinds of superstitions and anxieties. And it leads people into all kinds of vulnerabilities to being exploited by people who claim to know something about God when they don't. And so Mark, his name is John Mark, when he, he who is the author of this account of Jesus' life called the Gospel of Mark... Mark is in a hurry to tell us something true about God. And he really doesn't waste any time whatsoever getting down to business in his book. Just a single sentence introduction and not a diversion or a rabbit trail anywhere else in the book from beginning to end. Because an event has taken place that radically changes the way we look at and experience the world, really. And Mark can't wait to tell us about it. The sooner we get the message, the better off we'll be. Because the message is good, incredibly good. God is here. And he's on our side. So today we're going to begin a new series from the Gospel of Mark. 
And I'm calling this series Astonished. Because I want us to see how astonished people were who encountered Jesus for the first time. God in the living flesh standing there in front of them. And my prayer is, really deeply, that we will be astonished as well. Astonished by His power, by His authority, by His grace, and by His mercy. That we'll be astonished by it. By Him. And so today we're going we're gonna to watch two episodes of the story. Okay, We're going to see John the Baptist baptizing people in a river telling them to get ready for God's arrival. And then we're going to see Jesus Christ showing up at that river and God audibly speaking from the sky. And listen, what God says from the sky, what He says is astonishing. I'm going to show you that. And so look at Mark 1, verse 1. Here's that one sentence introduction to the entire story of Jesus' life that Mark gives us. The beginning of the gospel, the good news, the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's the subject. He's the point of every passage. He is the center of every story. He's the star of the entire drama. And the story begins here, right here in the river. And so, following to the letter... What the prophet Isaiah had written hundreds of years before. Watch closely. Watch closely. The words here are addressed to God's Son. Verse 2. Behold. In other words, watch closely. I send my messenger before your face. In other words, ahead of you. Who will prepare your way. He'll be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, saying, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make His paths straight. He is saying, Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road smooth and make the roads straight. The idea here, the image here is um, a lot like when major cities prepare to host the Olympics, think, you know what they do. They fix the roads up. They, they freshen up the buildings and the parks. They even, they even build new buildings and new structures and new parks. And they, and they organize the traffic and all the transport in to watch the games. And c- cities spend billions of dollars on this to make a good impression. And to gain the admiration of all the people and all the dignitaries of all around the world. You're going to get a lot of press out of this, right? And John's using that kind of imagery. That kind of, that kind of idea. Get everything ready for the arrival of these special guests. But John isn't calling for that kind of an extreme makeover in Jerusalem and the surrounding towns. No, but he's using that symbolic language. That kind of picture to call for something much, much deeper something far more significant. He is saying this. He's saying, clear the debris and throw out the clutter in your lives. Remove the roadblocks in your hearts. Open up yourselves to God and let Him in. Let him walk into your life without any obstructions or any objections from you. Without any resistance and without any reservations in you. That's what John is saying. In other words, number one, you see it on the screen already. Get Here's how John the Baptist got himself ready to get the people ready. Verse 4. John, it says, appeared. Mark's use of language here is very, very tight. It's very minimal. He gets to the point very quickly. John, there, there, there's no fluff here. John appeared. 
baptizing in the wilderness, this is the countryside, and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, think about it. The last time we've heard, anybody's heard anything about John the Baptist, the last time he was jumping for joy in his mother's womb. That's the last time we've heard anything about him. When Mary, the mother of Jesus, pregnant with Jesus, when she walked into the room, John the Baptist leaps in his own mother's womb. Here we have two unborn babies, one jumping for joy in the presence of the other. By the way, how did John know that? Well, Scripture tells us he was filled with the Holy Spirit in utero. John was God-chosen, Spirit-filled from his mother. We're seeing him do right here. He was born to announce the arrival of God on earth. God in our midst. So for the last 30 years... John has lived in obscurity, waiting for the day that he was preparing, God was preparing him for, to go public with this message. And now the day has come. Here he is. He's on the scene. Mark says, he appears. It seems out of nowhere. Out in the countryside, though. Not in the town square, not in the middle of everything, not in front of the news cameras, out in the countryside. But he's out there thundering this single sermon, this message from God about receiving a baptism of life. A baptism by anyone who is willing as a public turning away from sinful sin silly, God-ignoring, and God-insulting ways of life. Turn away from that. And by undertaking that, that baptism, you are not only turning away from that sinful and God-insulting way of living, but also gladly receiving God's generous forgiveness for everything you've ever done that's ever been displeasing to God or ever thought. So it's a turning away and it's a receiving. It's a giving up and a getting. Turning away from sin and getting God's forgiveness. And the reason they were being called to do that was so that when God does arrive on the scene, you'll be ready for Him. Because God's arrival, unlike the arrival of a president or a prime minister or a king or any other high dignitary, God's arrival is an honor and a joy like no other. Because he, he is like no other. And the very idea, the very idea that the transcendent, holy, holy, holy God, the living God who created the world, and sovereignly rules every molecule in it with invincible authority. The idea that he would want to come down here and get anywhere near our messy, broken, dirty lives, much less want to come down here to help us. Now that is an honor and a privilege that's honestly beyond belief. And the anticipation of that, that that could really happen, that, that idea that that God would come down here where we live in our broken, messy, dirty, ordinary lives, that idea was so magnetic so compelling that hordes of people crowded to hear John announce that out in the country. People wanted to get in on this. 
I mean, they, they didn't want to get left out. They didn't want to left out, get left out if there was a chance that God was going to come anywhere near where they lived. Mark 5, verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5. It says, all the country of Judah, Judea, and all Jerusalem baptized, immersed by him in the river Jordan. Watch what they're doing. Confessing their sins. I mean, what a scene this is. Try to get in your mind the picture. Try to get the scene in your mind, in your imagination. John is standing there in the river. And people are streaming out to where he's at. And as they hear him speak, his words are hitting home. They're, they're hitting deep. People are taking it to heart. And they're opening up their hearts. In fact, they're doing more than just opening up their hearts. They're opening up their secrets. Because you know what they're doing? They're confessing their sins. Openly. And life. Even Paul puts it this way in Romans. Buried with him in baptism. Buried with him in his death. Raised to what? Do you know what, the, what it says? Raised to what? Newness of life. They're being baptized into a changed life. It's the kind, it, this is the kind of thing. Get the scene in your mind. John's baptizing. People are coming. They're hearing him thunder the message. God's coming. God's coming. Get ready. Get your life cleaned up. And they're confessing, they're getting all the junk and their life out in the open, out of the way, getting God's forgiveness. This is the kind of thing that happens when God brings revival. This is what happens. People start confessing their sins. People start repenting of the ways they've been acting and thinking and living and talking. People begin longing for something more significant. They begin longing for cleansing. They long to be made right with God. God's not just an... And they're convicted. And they want to be made right with God. Listen, here's the scene here. God's word is being spoken. And people are responding... And they're believing. And they're obeying. They're not just hearers of the words. They're being doers of it. They are getting themselves ready for God. And it's not because they're so impressed with John. I mean, he's really nothing to look at. Have you seen him? <laughs> I mean, he has, he's, he's, he's wearing... Camel hair clothes. Tied at the waist with a, with a leather belt. And eating locusts and wild field honey. And he's telling them plain and simple. He's telling them up front, listen, everyone, you need to understand, I'm nothing here. The real action comes next. That's what John is saying. The real action comes next. He says in verse 7. Read it with me. After me comes he who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie. Verse 8. I've baptized you. I've immersed you in water. But he will immerse you with the Holy Spirit. Big diff. In other words, I'm immersing you here in this water, helping you exchange your old life for a new kingdom life, but this is nothing compared to what he'll do for you. I mean, wait till he gets here. He'll immerse you with the Holy Spirit, and he'll change you from the inside out. And what a thing to anticipate, right? What an anticipation. 
What an awesome expectation of what could come and what could happen to you. And then it came. God came. That's what I want you to see. God is here and he's on our side. So one day, one day while John is baptized, we don't have any days this went on or weeks or months. We're not told. But one of these days, in the midst of this storyline, as the crowd is standing on the banks of the river, trying to get in line, trying to get in, get baptized by John, there was a man in the midst, in the line, who was being immersed by John. One man. And when that one man was, in, was immersed, something extraordinary happened. It had never happened before, and it never happened again. As that man was coming up out of the water, clothes soaked, face dripping with water, at that exact moment, the sky split open. Watch closely. Verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. You know, a lot of people wonder why Jesus was baptized. I mean, even John the Baptist was confused that Jesus even wanted to be baptized. I mean, remember, Jesus had to, had to convince John to do it. Because baptism is a sign of repentance from sin. But Jesus didn't have any sins to repent of, did he? Hello? That's true. So he must have done it for another reason. Well, the Apostle Matthew tells us in his account of Jesus' life, in his account of this story, that in Jesus' own words, he did it to, quote, fulfill all righteousness, unquote. Jesus said, I will do this to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all God's righteous requirements. See, one of God's righteous requirements is not only to turn away from sin, but also to turn completely toward God and trust Him and obey Him. That's what repentance entails. It's two things at once. It's a turning away and a turning toward, right? If you take a ball and throw it against the wall, what's it going to do? It's going to bounce and go the other way. So repentance is not just a turning away from something, bouncing off the, away from the wall. It's going toward a new target, a new object. And so when we turn from our sins, we're not only walking away from our sins, we're, we're turning toward the Lord in faith and obedience. Okay? And Jesus is doing that publicly. He is turning his back on all disobedience to God. Now, he had never disobeyed God, but he is publicly turning his back on all disobedience to God, and he is publicly demonstrating his complete and total devotion and trust in God, his complete obedience to God, publicly declaring that. And Jesus did that on the cross, we Christians say that, we believe that, we understand that, that's the, at the heart of the gospel. He took our place on the cross, but do you understand that Jesus also took our place even in the act of baptism? He's representing us there. That his righteous obedience to God in that act has now been credited to me and to you. Jesus obeyed for me. Jesus, Jesus obeyed for you. And so in that moment, as in all the moments of his life, Jesus is being our substitute. He's being our Savior. So Jesus not only died to take away our sins, he lived to give us his righteousness. And that's why he lives again. And to make that really plain... When Jesus comes up out of the water, he experiences, and everyone else watching, experiences three supernatural signs that show beyond any doubt 
that God accepts Jesus in our place. Three signs that verify that he is the highly exalted, greatly esteemed by God, Savior of sinnerly. Astonishing words. So at the moment Jesus comes out of the water, get, get the picture, he's dripping wet, he comes up out of the water, his face is to the sky as he's coming up, and at that moment the sky was torn open. The Holy Spirit descends out of heaven, looking like a dove, and rests on Jesus. What's that all about? Well, in the same way, go back to the Old Testament, book of Genesis. When the dove found a place to rest in the midst of the waters... Jesus standing in the midst of the waters of the Jordan River. And God says visually, with this symbolic descent of a dove upon Jesus, God is saying, Jesus of Nazareth is the one who will deliver you from judgment. That's what he's saying. He's the one through whom my peace will come. He's the Savior of the world. So this is the sign announcing God's mercy and his sign announcing salvation and that it's found in one place. It's found in this man, Jesus Christ. So, so there can be no mistake as to who that one man is. God gives us this final climactic sign of the skies and says out loud for everyone to hear, with everyone listening, he says how greatly he's pleased with his son. And he says these words, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And God in that moment, openly and unmistakably, identifies this man, Jesus Christ, as God in the flesh. As his own son. God himself identified Jesus of Nazareth as the son of God. And in that very short but potent statement from the living God, God exalts Jesus far, far above any other person who's ever lived or ever will. Nothing compared to this man. World leaders, nothing compared to the power of this man. No one before him and no one since has been so God-declared as having equal status with God. There's no one like him. And God says in front of everybody that he loves him. He loves him. And that he's well pleased with him. Which makes me wonder all the more that he would love me 
and you and the rest of the world as to send his deeply loved son down here to suffer and die to save a bunch of miserable wretches like you and me. It's stunning. It's stunning. It's astonishing that that person who is so loved would be sacrificed for you and me. That's love the likes of which you have never experienced before. What this means is that God's love and God's delight in His Son, Jesus, is so immense that it overflows to every one of us who are in His Son by faith. That's what it means. That God's soul delights in us too because we're in His Son in whom He delights. And so when we get in on, think about this, we get in on God's love for Jesus. You ever thought about that? We get in on God's love for Jesus. And that makes Jesus so worthy of being loved by us. Amen? And of being the person in the universe who who we join in with God in loving and being well pleased in. Amen? Joining God in that. Here's the good news. The good news is that when God came here, He wasn't angry. You know, in the Old Testament, there are stories where when the prophet of God showed up to your town unannounced, it freaked everybody out. There are stories when Samuel rides up with cow in hand to be sacrificed, at the elders of the city asking, oh my goodness, what have we done? You've come here to sacrifice? Are you coming to appease God because he is angry at us for something that's gone on in our city that he's noticed that's so evil? What was it? What did we do? The fear of the Lord ran deep. I mean, they'd remembered what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so when John shows up saying, God's coming, he's coming, he's on his way, prepare for his arrival, you might understand the anxieties that some the people might feel. It's the same thing Isaiah felt when he was in the presence of the Lord and saw the Lord high and lifted up and and the seraphim singing holy, 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 and he absolutely fell to pieces. The good news is that when God did show up, He wasn't angry. He didn't come looking to scorch us with judgment like we deserve. He came here in the person of Jesus to show us that He's actually on our side. He came here to help us. Jesus himself said it. John, the good news that Mark cannot wait for us to hear and believe in the stories of Jesus' life. That God has arrived, and it's astonishing how magnificent and how merciful he is to us. And it's astonishing how highly exalted he is by God. From the beginning of the story, I mean, there's no doubt here. And the purpose of the story... The purpose of the gospel of Mark and the purpose of all these sermons that are being derived out of this gospel is to invite us to join in with God in exalting Jesus and loving Jesus and being as well pleased with Jesus as God himself is. Because there's no one like him 
anywhere. And we get to know him. And that's good news. Will you pray with me? Oh, Holy Spirit, would you please fill our eyes with the bright beauty of how magnificent and exalted Jesus really, really is. To gaze upon the one whose glory is front and center. And Holy Spirit, would you help us to see how much he, Jesus Christ is loved by the Father and how loved we are by the Father that he would send Jesus and sacrifice him up for us. And I ask that you would come and fill our hearts with such deep, deep delight in Christ and love for Christ that our hearts would overflow with joy over him and that our hearts would rest deeply in his grace and mercy. And then one more thing, God. Would you please set our tongues loose with unstoppable expressions of this good news so that other people can get in on it with us forever. Do this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.